regulation after regulation I think there are outdated regulations that need to be changed. 185,000 pages. Without in public the code accountability and transparency, there will be no public support. Is this really the best we can do? If there's a regulation that doesn't make any sense, why do you keep... Do you know who wrote the regulatory laws you must comply with? Welcome to the Regulatory Transparency Project's fourth branch podcast series. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Hello and welcome to this Regulatory Transparency Project virtual event. My name is Jack Derwin and I'm Assistant Director of RTP at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the guest speakers joining us today. To learn more about our speakers and their work, you can visit regproject.org to view their full bios. After opening remarks and discussion between our panelists, we'll go to audience Q&A. Please enter any questions into the Q&A function and we will address them as time allows. Today, we're pleased to host a conversation titled Eyes to the Sky, Privacy, Property, Innovation, and Commerce in the Age of the Drone. To discuss this timely topic, we have a great panel featuring Matthew Feeney, who is the Director of the Project on Emerging Technologies at the Cato Institute, Brent Skorup, who is a Senior Research Fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, Gregory Walden, who is a partner at Denton's, and our moderator today, Gregory McNeil, who is a tenured professor of law and public policy at Pepperdine University and the co-founder of AirMap. And with that, Greg, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thanks to everyone who's uh, joined us this afternoon or who's listening uh, to the recording after, uh, after this live presentation. It's really a pleasure to host this discussion today uh, on what it really is a timely topic about drones, privacy, and commerce, uh, especially at this point in time now where drones are really at a, at a tipping point where they're about to become integrated into our everyday lives. And we've heard many talk about that for a long period of time. Uh, I myself as an academic have been working in the field related to drones since at least 2012. And then as an entrepreneur through my company since 2015, and for a long time, we've been saying that the era of the drone is right around the corner, um, but largely government regulations have uh, slowed the ambitions of entrepreneurs. But it does seem that we are now at a point where the regulatory timelines, as they've slogged along, have now reached a point where we really are about to see uh, commerce explode. And with that, a lot of clashes with privacy property rights, and then a lot of benefits uh, from this amazing technology starting to uh, deliver commercial goods, starting to deliver benefits for businesses through efficiencies. And so this is a really timely topic. And the book published by uh, Cato University Press brings together multiple author, authors discussing um, a variety of different perspectives, right? from, a, from pro-commerce perspectives to libertarian perspectives, property rights perspectives, federalism perspectives. Um, and it's really a worthwhile read. And I would encourage everyone who's here on the call uh, to check out the book and, and grab a copy of it. So with that introduction out of the way, I'd like to begin by having Gregory Walden um, uh, start off and kick us off with an introduction to the topic. So uh, go ahead, Greg Walden. Thank you, Greg. Um, and uh, welcome to those on, um, on, the, on the call. Um, we're not quite 10 years from the first um, action by Congress in providing direction to the Federal Aviation Administration on, on getting a drone or UAS regulatory framework in place. Uh, drones have been here for decades and the FA had fooled around with uh, some informal guidance um, uh, in the um, in, in the in the decades before uh, the 2012 reauthorization act but when Congress actually looked at this and said okay FA you have the following directions on on coming out with a rule uh, using uh, uh, test sites and keep your hands off model aircraft and hobbyists uh, for the most part um, and that spawned um, a, uh, a bunch of, well, I think it was so 5,000 exemptions to allow drone operate, uh, operations before the FAA actually had a rule authorizing commercial operations. That, that uh, rule came in play in 2016. Uh, Congress also uh, put out some other uh, requirements in 2016. And then the third big reauthorization bill uh, dealing with drones was in 
2018. So what the drone industry started uh, by getting exemptions to fly, um, uh, but until there was a rule in place, that exemption process was was protracted. For some, it was um, not even successful. But again, 5,000 exemptions. When the rule came in place, Part 107, uh, it, it basically obviated um, exemptions. That is, you could operate under the rule beyond uh, within the visual line of sight, under 400 feet above ground level uh, at, in, during the day, operating one drone at a time. And there were some other limit, limitations. Well, OK, that rule <laughs> was good as far as it went. And there are tens of thousands of drone operators and drone users that can operate and even make a profit within that Part 107 framework. But really for the drone industry to, to take off, and sorry for the mixed metaphor with aviation, you really need um, widespread beyond visual line of sight operations. This is not simply for package delivery, but also for say infrastructure inspection or delivery of, of vaccines and other medical um, equipment. So the FA did say, okay, we have this commercial rule in place, but we'll allow for waivers under the rule, but oh, you can't get that waiver to go beyond visual line of sight if you're carrying packages, doing anything for a compensation or higher. For that, you'll need some sort of a certificate, an operator certificate, and the FA's only granted three of those to date. They did make progress in, in coming out with two rules uh, on the same day to authorize operations over people, that is directly over people, and to operate and to require drones to be equipped with remote identification. Uh, that operations real final rule also authorized nighttime operations, the nighttime exam, uh, waivers and exemptions became routine. So it was just a matter of time before the FE said, well, can, we can authorize that by rule. So where we are right now is, is <laughs> there are um, many operations within the, the visual line of sight uh, for uh, inspection, uh, for cinematography or for photography, weddings and that sort of thing, they're, they're fine. But again, package delivery for whatever reason and some infrastructure inspection going under bridges, going in tunnels, that requires um, further uh, rulemaking. And the exemptions that are granted right now, uh, in addition to the waivers uh, under Part 107, the exemptions are necessary if you are, again, uh, want to operate uh, with a uh, for, for package delivery for compensation or higher, or if you're operating a drone over 55 pounds. What's next? Well, uh, the FA has set up an aviation rulemaking committee for beyond visual line of sight operations. So uh, eventually we're going to get a rule on beyond visual line of sight operations, but in terms of the timeline, it's unclear. Yes, the recommendations of the, of the ARC need to be submitted to the administrator by the end of this year. Very, very ambitious, uh, but that, that is just the first stage, actually a preliminary stage before the FA would publish a proposed rule. The FA is also, uh, I would say, not moving with dispatch with regard to type and airworthiness certification. Uh, there, uh, there are 10 uh, companies that have drones that are in the certification process, at least to the point where the FA has published airworthiness criteria, but none of those 10 have a type and airworthiness certif certificate. And under the law, you can't operate without, an, without your aircraft having an airworthiness certificate, unless of course you have a waiver or exemption as, as I discussed. Um, and then uh, finally, there is the unmanned traffic management or UTM system that is being um, uh, worked on right now and developed. Uh, NASA was in the vanguard and the FA uh, came in and with a pilot program directed by, by, uh, by Congress. And uh, we expect that, that UTM will be stood up within the next couple of years. Maybe not, you don't flip a switch and UTM is everywhere, but it will be at, at many places. UTM, beyond visual line of sight, uh, type and airworthiness certificate and detect and avoid technology, uh, which I just briefly touched upon right now. These are the big, uh, big things that need to be resolved. Not gonna be in six months, not gonna be a year, be a, several years before these things are mature. Great, thanks, Greg, and uh, thanks for the setup. Um, 
a lot of activities occurring. Um, and what it sounds like there is that the greatest amount of progress happened between 2012 and 2016, at least on certainty with regard to regulations. And then um, a lot of other activities and waiting for more concrete regulations since 2016, as we get almost to the 10 year anniversary of the FAA Modernization and Reform Act of 2012. I'm going to circle back, Greg, with some questions for you and just a, a comment for all of our participants. We will have a Q&A function that's enabled in uh, in Zoom. Um, you can see on the bottom of your screen, there's a, uh, not in the chat, but over on the right, a Q&A function. And you can tee up your questions in there. And after we get through all of the panelists, um, we will then have some questions from the moderator, me, to the panelists, and then we'll go to Q&A from, uh, from our callers. And so next, I'd like to bring in Brent Scorum uh, for a little bit of a discussion and sort of uh, going into some federalism and property issues. And so uh, go ahead, uh, Brent, why don't you kick us off there? Yeah, thanks, Greg. And I, I want to thank Matthew Feeney for um, putting the book together, bringing, bringing these experts together. And it was, uh, it was an honor to contribute my chapter. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my chapter in the book, Eyes to the Sky, uh, which, which is a great resource uh, for anyone working in this area. Uh, my chapter is Who Should Govern the Skies? And uh, this, this is a, 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 an important question. As is, is, is Greg Walden uh, indicated, things have moved fairly slowly. And, and I, I think... Um, I think the framework I, I have in my chapter helps explain how how things could move more quickly and 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 the how time consuming and and costly for industry would be if if we if we choose the, the wrong approach. Um, and so how I set up the chapter, I say there there's two two clean categories, and everything in real life is a spectrum. Uh, but there are two clean categories for who regulates public assets. You can have federal regulation or you can have state regulation, and, and also two approaches to regulation of public assets. You can have market rationing or administrative rationing. And, and you can kind of think of this in, in kind of four ideal categories. Again, in real life, it's a spectrum, but so you can have federal uh, market, uh, that would be something like uh, radio spectrum, which is leased or auctioned uh, for 10 year periods. Now the federal government gets, gets revenue from private companies. You can have state market, and that would be something like timberland leasing um, in state forests. You can also have federal administrative, uh, something like airport slots, which are uh, administered by the federal government, the, the FAA, to private uh, commercial airlines, and, and state administrative rationing, something like taxi medallions, which are awarded to private companies. Um, and I, I know on, on these latter two, uh, the administrative ones, the sl airport slots and taxi medallions, these are awarded by regulators, but then there's an active secondary market uh, of private companies, which indicates that regulators are, are, are giving away for free something that has a has pretty substantial market value. Um, drones, and, and largely because of inertia, largely because the uh, federal regulators have regulated traditional aviation for, for decades, drones have fallen into the federal administrative uh, framework, I would say. And, and this, this presents, uh, well, there are some possible problems with this, with this inertia. Um, one is uh, just practical realities, the day to day of the agency, which has a lot of tasks, not, not related to drones. Um, and relatedly as, as Craig Walden, I think kind of alluded to, it, it doesn't drone regulation doesn't seem to be a major priority for the FAA. You know, this, this, this agency that regulates uh, manned flights and commercial airlines, um, drones have kind of fallen through through the cracks. And one indication of this, um, Congress instructed the FAA in 2016, five years ago, to uh, identify drone no-fly zones across the nation for sensitive infrastructure, theme parks, and, and so forth. Uh, Congress later gave them a deadline of early 2020 to, to get this done, identify these drone no-fly zones. So the instructions came from Congress five years ago. They had a deadline of in, in 2020, and, and they haven't even started th this process, this uh, 2209 uh, process. There's not even an FPRM out. 
which if, if you're an industry, this is really discouraging. You're, you're spending cash every year and it's another year of, of no revenue. So, um, so th this is a problem. You can't have an industry based on regulatory waivers that can be revoked at any time, which has been the process so far. Um, but th there is, there is progress, but, um, but there are also some legal issues as well with this, this kind of federal administrative uh, uh, category that we find ourselves in. Surface airspace is private property. Um, and, and by surface airspace, um, I'm talking about the airspace uh, below 500 feet, which the FAA is not classified as, as navigable airspace to date. But at, at some altitude, surface airspace is, is private property. And this has been held by the Supreme Court in air, air, airline cases in the past. Uh, where it can be a takings if, if you're flying frequently through uh, through low altitude airspace. You also have the issue that uh, related issue because air surface airspace is property, you run into state sovereignty questions. Uh, states typically have sovereignty over and 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 determine how property rights are, are shaped. And, and Laura Donahue in the book has a great chapter about this topic, uh, so I, I won't belabor it. But um, but I will say. This is a potential threat and, and could create complications with this federal administrative program we have uh, for, for drone policy. And proposal I, I talk about in the book and my other writing is, is a system of cooperative federalism, given the fact that drones involve uh, not only interstate commerce and, and safety of traditional aviation, but also interstate commerce and, and questions of property rights and trespass and nuisance and takings that the states will have to deal with. Um, and I, I also propose a system of uh, an airspace market, much like spectrum auctions or offshore oil leases or, or timber leases, um, so that regulators are not gifting this valuable public asset um, to private companies, that, that there's a return for the use of this valuable public asset in particular, the, the public rights of way or, or airspace above public property uh, would, would be a good place to allow drone operators uh, uh, more freedom to operate um, at low altitudes. And in fact, many states, over 20 states, allow airspace leasing above public roadways. The, these laws have not been used for drones, but I think it's a, a pretty good way and a pretty quick way of granting uh, millions of miles of uh, up to millions of miles of, of airspace uh, uh, to drone operators for them to deploy and, and, and deploy commercial services. But I'm sure we'll talk more about some of this, but that's, that's uh, what my chapter covers. Great. Thank you, Brent. And uh, now we'll go to uh, our editor, Matthew Feeney, um, to talk a little bit about um, uh, privacy, surveillance, and some of the law enforcement aspects related to drones. And so I'm going to hand it off to you now, Matt, uh, Matthew. Great. Thank you. Um, and, and I want to... Uh yeah, thank thank all of you uh, listening live and those of you listening um, after the recording. Uh, but you know, a special thanks, of course, to um, Greg Walden and Brent for writing uh, two of the the seven chapters in this book. Uh, I think anyone interested in uh, ongoing drone policy issues, whether it's uh, privacy, commerce, uh, federal regulation, will get a lot out of it. Uh, Brent Brent already alluded to a chapter by uh, Professor uh, Donahue from Georgetown and. Uh, if you want to learn about what you know, the Ninth Crusade and um, King Edward I um, have to do with drone um, drone law, um, this is the book for you. Uh, I thought, given that uh, Greg and Brent had spoken about some of the issues about uh, commercial uh, regulation of drones or the, their applications, I would discuss uh, some of the concerns that are towards the end of the book, uh, and these deal with uh, uh, surveillance and and privacy. Uh, many, many people are already familiar with the fact that um, the federal government certainly uh, uses drones to patrol the northern and southern borders and state and local law enforcement agencies are increasingly interested in using aerial surveillance uh, devices. Uh, those of you who pay attention to news in the surveillance world will know that it's not uncommon for uh, large uh, federal predator drones to be used for surveillance, um, but smaller um, assets like airplanes with um, with certain uh, cameras that can keep cities under surveillance have been used, perhaps most notably in Baltimore. 
And the, uh, th this, I think, raises interesting uh, Fourth Amendment issues, but the, the Supreme Court is yet to take a aerial surveillance case associated with drones. Um, there are a number of cases from the 1980s uh, dealing with aerial surveillance where the court held that you do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy to the contents of your private property uh, being observed from an airplane or, or a helicopter. And th these kind of issues are what uh, uh, the two authors, uh, Jake Leperuk from the Project on Government Oversight and Jay Stanley from the ACLU, uh, tackle. And I thought it would be worth me uh, just outlining at least um, some of um, their concerns and proposals before turning to a case uh, that came out earlier this year from the, the Fourth Circuit, which I think um, may uh, showcase how courts will deal with these kind of issues in the future. Um, the, the first chapter that I want to, to briefly discuss is uh, Jake Leperuk's, uh, where he outlined six rules that he thinks uh, legislatures should be implementing. Uh, one is, uh, I won't go through all in exhaustive detail, but I do want to mention a couple. I mean, one is the uh, mandatory use of probable cause warrants. Uh, although the Supreme Court um, you know, has held that there isn't a Fourth Amendment violation for warrantless searches. Uh, we've seen that at least a dozen states have um, imposed warrant requirements for uh, for drone surveillance, uh, which is something that that Jake recommends. Um, there's also uh, requirements for disclosing certain details about the technology, um, how it's used, and when it's used. Uh, also, an exhaustion requirement that uh, this is not a go-to or routine uh, piece of surveillance kit that law enforcement use on on a on an everyday basis, um, and also the introduction of some some sunset provisions. Uh, something that that Jake also discusses uh, that I want to highlight is the importance of definitions here. Uh, part of his chapter discusses. Uh, that uh, Miami police tried to get around um, certain prohibitions on using drones by using a blimp with a uh, camera attached to it, uh, because under the definition of drone, uh, such a blimp um, attached to to a vehicle did not did not fit the the definition. Jay Stanley from the SOU uh, writes a lot about the current use of the federal use of of drones um, for surveillance, uh, but goes on to discuss some of the more disturbing uses of uh, technologies such as um, automatic tracking and, and things such as that. Uh, and Jay also does a good job, I think, of um, emphasizing that we should really think of drones as platforms for uh, a range of surveillance devices. I mean, obviously, uh, cameras being the most notable, but th there are others that can be attached. Uh, and I'll wrap up before turning to, to Q&A and maybe taking the conversation further by, by noting that uh, earlier this year, the Fourth Circuit did hold that um, Baltimore's aerial surveillance program did violate the Fourth Amendment. Uh, what I think is interesting here is that the, the court did not rely on cases from the 1980s uh, dealing with aerial surveillance, uh, which I suppose you might expect, but actually relied on a more recent case, uh, Carpenter, which uh, deals with um, cell site location information, where the Supreme Court did hold that uh, people do have a reasonable expectation of privacy in uh, your, the whole of your physical uh, movements. And uh, that, that I think is a, a, an interesting um, approach to it. So uh, those of you who are uh, Fourth Amendment nerds or keeping an eye on the state of the surveillance um, may see more and more courts when they're thinking about the Fourth Amendment and aerial surveillance actually reaching not back to the 1980s to helicopter and airplane cases, but dealing with uh, Fourth Amendment cases that are associated with uh, different technologies, namely cell phones. Uh, so, with that, I'm I'm happy to um, talk talk for, further um, and to to take your your questions. Thank you, uh, Matthew. So let me uh, let me start with uh, my own question. Uh, it's actually going to begin uh, with moderator's privilege to set it up with a with a statement. As you all know, I have strong opinions about this. And so I'm going to riff a little bit off of Greg's setup from the regulatory timelines, right? So if we think back in 2012, when Congress passes the FAA Modernization and Reform Act, the thing everyone was talking about at the time were predators and reapers on the battlefield. And I remember when the uh, when Congress passed uh, the uh, uh, its legislation, the phone calls I got from uh, journalists were, you know, battlefield technology is coming to the United States. And I think many people believed that the FAA's focus on integration was going to be about these large UAS that Matthew just referenced, the types that are presently patrolling the uh, the borders of the United States and sometimes are used in the interior of the United States and law enforcement actions. 
But the agency's focus shifted. Um, and my thought is it shifted because the explosion of uh, recreational or what we might call prosumer or light sort of commercial drones. The, the uh, primary manufacturer of them at the time was, was a Chinese company called DJI and an American company called 3D Robotics. These were the remote controlled drones that someone could buy at Best Buy or on Amazon fly them essentially like a remote control helicopter and use them for a variety of, of uh, recreational or, or commercial purposes. And these exploded, right? Uh, uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of sales of these. And the agency as a safety agency became very concerned about these and used the legislative mandate under the FAA Modernization and Reform Act to pass its first set of regulations that Greg talked about that were proposed in 2015 and finalized in 2016. And then largely the agency could say, look, we addressed our problem. We're a safety agency. We addressed a problem. And now anything new, like what industry pumped all its money into for uh, package delivery drones beyond visual line of sight drones, the, the really the millions of drones conducting billions of daily flights well, that's something new and safety agencies don't like new because as one uh, bureaucrat at the FAA told me, the safest day in modern aviation history was the day after the worst day in modern aviation history, which was September 11th. The safest day was September 12th because all of the aircraft were grounded so no accident could happen. And that's what someone at the FAA actually told me. So with that sort of setup, uh, let me start with, uh, with Brent. Right now, my sense is that a bunch of, you know, 100,000 or less people walking around with their drones, flying within line of sight, are just a bunch of remote control helicopter operators. And we don't have a lot of property issues. Or Matthew, we don't really have a lot of privacy issues. Your local police department doesn't have a lot of predators and reapers. And um, if they have a drone in the trunk of their police car, they can only fly it within line of sight. And so to Brent first, what are we going to face when this beyond visual line of sight thing comes online and drones can operate autonomously beyond visual line of sight from a police station? They can take off and respond to a 911 call. They can patrol streets on their own. But what are the issues, Matthew, with that or Brent, when drones can conduct package delivery operations or, you know, land use survey operations at low altitudes at high scale. So Brent on the property stuff first, high scale, and then Matt. So Brent, go ahead with, with that thought, high scale operations, not the kind of stuff we're dealing with today. Yeah. Yeah. And I, the way I try to think of this, uh, of drones is, is much like kind of traditional vehicles today where if, if you're on your property, I, I you know, uh, you, you should have a lot of freedom to, to use uh, vehicles as, as you see fit. You know, I think of like four wheelers and snowmobiles and dirt bikes on, on your own property. Um, you know, there's not, there's not huge government interest in, in what's going on um, with, within reason. Um, once, once you're on public roadways, uh, you, so to speak with, with drones, once you're, flying at high altitudes, um, not on your own property, uh, uh, there, there's a, there's pretty substantial government interest in, in what happens. And, and I think, I think you see that with some of the drone regulations and kind of the purpose behind remote ID so that police and, and landowners and others can know who's, who's flying in, in case, uh, something goes awry. The, the issues, the, the property issues and legal issues are, are pretty substantial once you are doing long distance flights or, or a mass delivery service of some kind. Um, I, I have a law journal article in the Akron Law Review coming out about airspace's property. And it's actually a pretty old idea. Um, you have legal treatises 150 years ago discussing uh, the idea of separating airspace from the land beneath it. Um, and airspace sales have been going on for, for decades. Airspace, surface airspace is property. It's treated by courts as property. And for that reason, these long distance drone flights, if you're flying residential areas, there are, and you are seeing issues of trespass to property and nuisance lawsuits. 
if if it's authorized by the government, you run into takings issues and 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 all of these. Uh, uh, you know, I I wrote the law journal article and I've read about this topic because if if lawmakers and and the industry don't don't uh, proceed with these in mind, it could create a lot of problems. Uh, every every landowner. Every every piece of land you fly over is potentially a trespass or nuisance lawsuit or a takings lawsuit uh, to a local government or federal government, um, and so it's important to get ahead of this. and And that's why, at least in the short term, I, I see this idea of uh, drone easements above public roadways as, as a way of avoiding a lot of the tricky trespass, nuisance, and, and takings issues that uh, and privacy issues. That, you know, not to mention privacy issues that you might see. Uh, Brent, on a on a related point, we do we have a question in the uh, in the Q and A that that's actually related to this, so I'm going to insert it now. What about drone highways and tollways, right? So if you're saying people have property and easements, then can they charge for overflights of their property? Like, sure, you can fly over my property, but I'm, I'm gonna uh, it's going to cost five bucks. Is that, that's why I like the, uh, using roadways, using existing rights of way. I mean, that, that gives a company, I mean, just like UPS today on the ground, uh, by using roadways, you, you have access to pretty much every residential property without using private property, without driving, of course, across private property. And so I, you, you can avoid, uh, you, you know, the potential of people um, uh, holding out for, for uh, you know, egregious uh, rates for flying over over the property. You use use the public roadways um, and and the airspace, the public rights of way, because uh, uh, yeah, I mean, absent legislation and and, and a, a revolution in Supreme Court uh, positions on this topic, uh, you, you do run into the trespass and and, uh, and the payment issue really quickly in residential areas. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I think there are other other models. Again, uh, kind of this drone easement, approaching it much like spectrum auctions. You know, a ten year lease uh, uh, where private companies have a property interest to it. So Brent, doesn't that then run into the problem that, like, let's say, let's say there's a distribution facility to use a DC example in Bethesda, Maryland, and it has to deliver to uh, Columbia, Maryland, to use an example. Um, the advantage of a drone would be that it can fly line of sight A to B. I mean, sorry, uh, as the crow flies from A to B, asking it to follow the roadways, you know, the, the beltway or roadways, doesn't that ruin the, all of the advantages of this technology that make it so wonderful? You know, they, it essentially becomes just a, a truck in the sky and it's no faster. So why would we bother with this technology at that point? Well, I think a lot of the cost benefits come more from autonomy um, and, and, and having a, you know, a remote operator handling multiple uh, deliveries at once uh, more, more than the distance. I've, I've looked into the distance question because I've been asked about this before and there's not much on the topic, but if you're using roadways, uh, generally adds about 40% uh, compared to as a crow flies. So uh, for, for what that's worth, uh, you know, and, and I mean, and there is another approach. It's, it, can, it gets very costly if you're hit with trespass, nuisance and takings lawsuits for every, uh, for every flight as, as a crow flies. So, I'm not sure as a crow flies gets you the, the, the cost savings that, that you might think. Uh, let me ask you one last question, Brent, before I go to Matthew, and then I'm going to bring Greg, Greg in as well. I thought I heard in your remarks that, that you start from the premise that the navigable airspace ends at 500 feet. I've been a person who's sympathetic to the views that you have of property rights um, in airspace, you know, uh, extending from Cosby. But I don't know that the 500 foot line is the correct line. Uh, helicopters have been able to operate below 500 feet, at least as far as drones are concerned. The FAA has said that drones can operate anywhere. That's the FAA's position from zero to 400 feet. And that has turned all of that airspace, wherever a drone can operate, 
into navigable airspace. Uh, the FAA, when it comes to charting, says that obstacles below 200 feet don't have to be charted, but they have to be charted if they're above 200 feet. So, so isn't the, and then in Cosby, it says as much of the uh, airspace above your property as you can use, you know, in, in connection with that property. And who's really using airspace at 500 or 400 or 300 feet? It, it, isn't this really like a an 83 feet, 85 foot, 100 foot thing, not a 500 foot thing? I mean, 500 feet is, is insanely high. And um, that's a re the real barrier to this flight from A to B as the crows, crow flies. And so shouldn't the proposal go lower? And if it doesn't, don't you run the risk that the FAA would come along and just extend that navigable airspace line as a matter of federal rule much lower? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I should be precise. Uh, 500 feet um, is, is what's, what's codified, though. The FAA has, you know, the kind of a side note, uh, by the way, uh, helicopters taking off and landing and, and aircraft taking off and landing. Um, that, that's also naval airspace, but they've, they've never codified the view uh, that I've heard some drone operators make that all outdoor airspace is naval airspace. They, they've never codified that view. What, what was the second part of your question? So could the FAA change this? Uh, you know, so if it's premised upon where the FAA, so the cases have largely been premised upon, and this is true also as I go to Matthew and the uh, premised upon the FAA's assertion of what the airspace is, where does a person have a right to be? If the FAA changes that line, does that change the property rights and the observational line by yeah, dropping that um, line down? In, in short, no. Uh, it, what, what, what you take from uh, the Cosby and the Griggs case, uh, Cosby was 1946, an airplane case, and, and Griggs in 1962. Um, the short short of it is that navigable airspace yields to property rights at low altitudes. Um, in, in Cosby, this was the, the chicken farm case we all learned about uh, in property class and in a plane flying, military flight, planes flying frequently above, above uh, a farm is the takings. Uh, Griggs was similar, except in, in that case, um, the federal government thought they got clever and they said, no, well, now we're defining it as naval airspace. And, and Supreme Court and Griggs said, no, um, you, you can't just define as naval airspace. And, and then without compensation to landowners, they, they own airspace um, at low altitude. So as I said, absent a revolution, Supreme Court jurisprudence on this, um, surface airspace is private property. Um, in fact, the FAA, if you're an airport or if you're trying to expand an airport, you're required to gain navigation easements, which often means paying landowners for, for their air rights. Uh, so there, there are some substantial legal problems if for the FAA, which I think is why they haven't done it, to just saying all outdoor airspace is, is available to drone operators. All right. Thanks, Brent. And Greg Walden, I promise I'm going to come back to you. I'm going to, I'm going to have Brent set this up as he did. Then I'm going to go to Matthew and then I'm going to come to Greg Walden. And the question of Greg Walden is going to largely be, this looks pretty messy for innovation. So I'm setting you up, Greg. I'm going to come to you in a second. So Matthew, let me, let me set you up. So the question initially that I posed was, you know, police officers now with these drones operated within line of sight, it, that's not like the Baltimore aerial surveillance case with persistent surveillance. And so maybe you, there's an argument here that this changes when drones can start to operate beyond line of sight autonomously. But I don't see how that changes with Sorallo and Riley, for example. Sorallo said no reasonable expectation of privacy from aircraft to a thousand feet. Um, Riley says no reasonable expectation of privacy from, uh, what was it? A helicopter at 365 or 400. So the police park a bunch of drones operating autonomously between 365 and a thousand, um, under a new set of regulations. How has this changed it? Just the fact that there's no human operator has fundamentally changed the equation. I don't see how that changes the, the fourth amendment analysis. So, so what's the central animating concern that you're getting at in your research? Uh, why should we look at this, this differently? What, what, how have drones changed the privacy calculus for us? 
I think they've changed the the privacy calculus uh, in in a few ways. I mean, one is that uh, at it, it, it's fair to say that uh, many of the um, frightening stories people share about drone surveillance concentrate on these multi-million dollar predator drones um, outfitted with military grade uh, uh, surveillance technologies. And even the the Baltimore aerial surveillance case was a, um, a case in which the surveillance was funded by billionaire uh, philanthropists using technology that had previously been used in Afghanistan. And, you know, there, there I think um, the, the, the listeners will be familiar with what the, the concerns about keeping an entire city under uh, surveillance um, are. Uh, I think those concerns are pretty well grounded. Um, and, and nonetheless, though, I think at low altitudes, uh, police drones um, who still have the uh, capacity to see um, intimate parts of people's uh, homes and, you know, the backyards immediately come to mind. Uh, but we should also uh, remember. Uh, what uh, Stanley in his chapter emphasized, which is that drones can act as a platform for other surveillance tools. And um, at low altitudes, I think uh, facial recognition is um, perhaps the most um, the, the most concerning, but you can also, um, of course, outfit uh, drones with license plate scanning technology. Uh, but but I, I take the point, I think that the the actual on, on Fourth Amendment analysis, there doesn't seem to be necessarily much of a change between um, you know, a, a drone at, say, 400 feet or a, a, an airplane at 1,000. Certainly, I think though the cost of these things um, means that we should expect more of them if there isn't legislative or judicial um, breaks being applied. Uh, the, the kind of drones that can be pretty intrusive, um, you can, you know, private citizens can buy uh, drones for only a few thousand dollars that have incredible zoom capabilities. And so certainly police um, could easily um, engage in pretty significant snooping with a, a relatively cheap drone. Uh, but the, this is, I think, one of the concerns that motivated uh, Jake in his capture to, to emphasize the importance of minimization requirements, um, similar to the kind of requirements you see in wiretapping statutes, that uh, those um, who are the targets of the surveillance are the only um, uh, are the only ones supplying data that that, that can be used. Uh, obviously, you know it's not hard to imagine if you even if you had a warrant to survey someone's backyard, you would nonetheless collect video footage um, of other people's backyards. Uh, so, I, I, I think in before we have um, a, a, a really significant change in the the Supreme Court, um, which I, I don't think is going to happen anytime soon, I think it is probably um, something that um, states or the or Congress will have to take up uh, when it comes to imposing. Wire, uh, uh, warrant requirements or these kind of minimization uh, regulations. All right. Thanks, Matthew. All right, Greg. So uh, I imagine you might be uh, chomping at the bit here to respond a little bit. This sounds like a mess to me. How is um, an entrepreneur or one of the companies that you represent ever supposed to get off the ground, so to speak, when the FAA creates a bunch of regulations for, frankly, a bunch of people operating remote control toys that they're using for professional purposes. You've got um, Brent and some pretty sophisticated people who take an approach that say aircraft laws don't really necessarily fully apply here. It's really a cooperative federalism approach. You have folks um, like Matthew and the Civil Liberties um, Oriented Coalition who say, when these things come online, we've got some serious uh, privacy and Fourth Amendment concerns. And in that environment, you have a risk averse agency like the FAA who says any new technology that comes on, any new aircraft will pose a problem here. So you have a, an interagency problem. Uh, you have an interagency problem related to the property rights aspect where DOJ is going to have to uh, weigh in. Um, and you have this multitude of, of federalism problems. And we've seen for a while um, industry, as I might label uh, the some of the coalitions that, that you've worked with, hasn't wanted to yield on a lot of the policy positions because oftentimes when you yield a little bit, um, you can lose a lot of ground. So how, do, how does industry get any traction after almost a decade of these back and forth, largely having the same conversations? What's the path forward after 10 years of a bit of stagnation? Well, I don't think the path forward is bifurcating airspace, creating a line in the sky, or auctioning airspace. Uh, there are causes of action that have existed in common law, reflected also in state statutes, 
that uh, provide for a remedy for invasions of privacy and aerial trespass and nuisance. Uh, and I think we'll maybe muddle through that for a, a number of years on the occasional trans transitory drone uh, passage over someone's property. I really think that I, I, Brent's right. I think that the major savings um, for a company that is operating a drone rather than a, a, a truck may be in the fact that you don't need a driver, but from someone who's, who's asked for the package to be delivered and they're told, no, it's not going to go come in two minutes. It's going to go the same time it would take for uh, a car. Then all of a sudden the interest in using a drone um, drops down. I, I don't know that, that, that there is a surface air, the surface airspace sounds like an oxymoron. oxymoron. It, there is private property rights in airspace above private property. I don't know that that means that someone owns airspace. I think the, the Justice Douglas said, okay, yes, you, you own as much as airspace as you can use and enjoy from the virtue of, of your property. But there's no city airspace or state airspace. Uh, and Cosby, the takings case, which again, it's fine uh, where it is, uh, who recovered, why was the recovery? Because the drones were, I'm sorry, the aircraft was operated so low and so frequently as to deprive Cosby's of the use of enjoyment of their property. So low and so frequent. It wasn't just a simple trans, uh, transient passage over, over property. I think the, uh, the, the, the pathway forward is, yes, the FAA has to have a, a rulemaking framework that will be accepted by the public that the drones up there are uh, safe and reliable, that they're as, as safe and reliable as manned aircraft uh, that are operating at 10,000 feet or 20,000 feet with respect to operations that are at low altitude and, and of some frequency, there's going to have to be cooperation and a good neighbor policy from corporate uh, operators of drones and um, and neighborhoods and and other uh, areas, uh, I I maybe the FAA has not put in a rule that they that that they have the navigable airspace goes down to the ground. I don't think they need to say that because it's right there in the amended Federal Aviation Act, land necessary for takeoff and landing. And as long as drones are aircraft, then that's navigable airspace. Uh, now, having said that, the FAA has jurisdiction down to the ground is not does not displace state and local um, police powers. Those two can coexist, uh, but it will it may take some time to again muddle through on on what that what that uh, law is or whether there really is some sort of a line or or a confluence of uh, of uh, mix or analysis of factors that would support an aerial trespass or invasions of privacy. but um, again, bifurcating airspace is is not something that I think that the industry wants to see. Greg, um, uh, you you were the chief counsel of the of the FAA, um, and so as as part of that job, your office had to draft legal opinions, and so you're no doubt familiar with the uh, body of legal opinions that the office has put out with regard to the authority of states to regulate takeoff and landing for traditional aircraft. And so I'm wondering if a, if a fact pattern came to you like this, um, let's say the city of Santa Monica takes a look at um, its ordinances and on the third street promenade, which is a pedestrian walkway in the city of Santa Monica, where the city presently prohibits bicycles and scooters and skateboards and rollerblades, the city decides to pass an ordinance that has two components. Uh, the first or part of the ordinance says that, you know, no one standing upon the land in the city of Santa Monica may, let's say it has three components. No one standing upon the land in the city of Santa Monica may take off or land an unmanned aircraft from the third street promenade, may not operate a unmanned aircraft while standing upon the land. Uh, uh, within the borders of the city of Santa Monica. And finally, no unmanned aircraft may operate at skateboard altitude, so two inches above the ground, 
within the city of Santa Monica. How would your office walk through that? Is that a police powers type issue or is that the FAA's navigable airspace extends down to the ground and such a local law would be preempted entirely or the takeoff and landing parts might not be. And then we've got this question about the operator standing upon the land because we we have a unique sort of set of factual circumstances here. Like, how would you reason through it? You know, I have my own thoughts. I'm curious how someone with your background and then also uh, given the clients that you work with, how, how would you work through that um, that fact pattern? I'm not sure that I'm <laughs> I can channel uh, the current <laughs> thinking. It's at, a tough at one, the, right? The FAA, <laughs> but 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 uh, you start with takeoff and landing is something that the FA has recognized, um, even in the context of drones, that it is a, a province of uh, state and, and local regulation. Uh, they will caution. The caution is though that if a jurisdiction said no takeoff and landings at all in our jurisdiction you might have a dormant commerce clause type of, of uh, uh, argument that that is in uh, that the something that the FA would not cater to because we've seen I've seen letters from the FA that that uh, support a local restriction on say aerial advertising but if you ever get to the point of making it a categorical prohibition throughout a whole jurisdiction at all times then you've got a, a problem. Uh, I think when you get into regulating of operations, uh, not notwithstanding that someone is standing on the pier, but the operating above, I don't think you can kind of say, oh, well, because you're because you're standing there, then we can regulate operations. Uh, well, at what altitude and what what type of operations that gets comes dangerously close to uh, state and local regulation of of flight paths, which the FA, I think, has discouraged, um, even if they haven't put out an opinion to that. Uh, effect. Um, so I think they're, <laughs> they're, they will, they're not putting out much in the way of interpretations right now on, on this, um, on these issues. Um, we might see something in the next uh, year or so. There was a project at the end of the Trump administration uh, to get something in terms of guidance, more guidance out, uh, but that has um, stalled. And with the new administration, it's going to take some time for the new Folks, we need a new general counsel and a new chief counsel at DOT and FA, respectively, uh, to look at this issue and then decide what type of guidance is uh, is appropriate. Thanks, Greg. Greg, uh, if, Greg, if I may. Um, oh, you go ahead, Brent. This is Brent. Um, yeah, it's, it's not entirely hypothetical. There was a very similar case in, in federal district court for a few years. Um, yeah, I mentioned the, the FA is supposed to create these drone no-fly zones above sensitive infrastructure. Um, but hasn't states have been, I think 13 states have been creating drone no fly zones above, um, utility lines and jails and schools and so forth. And, and some drone operators sued Texas because of their law on this topic. And last year in November, um, in drone operators argued many things, uh, including that there, there was, uh, conflict and field preemption, that states cannot create journal, no fly zones above sensitive infrastructure. And, and the, the federal district court dismissed those arguments of prejudice, uh, those preemption arguments. So, um, you know, to me, that's a signal that, that there is, at, at least in this court in Texas, um, it's district court, federal court in Texas, there, there is a state role to play here. And uh, so it's it's not entirely hypothetical, and, and states are acting on this. They are creating drone off no fly zones, uh, which implies a uh, uh, power over operations, or at least exclude operations. I, I think I should say that Texas law, I think, has First Amendment issues for for other reasons, but yep. uh, it, could, it could fail. But um, but on, on the preemption issues, the court dismissed it with prejudice. Well, that's one district court, and there'll there'll be more. Um, I. I We'll, we'll say that I think on uh, the uh, the question of skateboard height, um, that is probably something that the FA would not um, object to. In again, if it were that, if it was a you can't operate below ten feet anywhere in the city of Santa Monica, different story, different story. Um, but at, in your hypothetical, Greg, it's, um, it's something I think the FA would probably not object to. 
I think you're right, Greg. And the, the interesting cases for the listeners would be on the one end of the spectrum. I think, Brent, you're referring to uh, National Press Photographers Association versus McCraw in uh, in, uh, in Texas. Then the other end of the spectrum would be City of Newton versus or Singer versus City of Newton would be the other district court case where um, so where a city regulation or ordinance was uh, was found to be um, preempted. And that ordinance was very broad, zero to 400 feet prohibiting and is essentially the entire city was a no fly zone. So these are two ends of the spectrum, right? Versus small delineated no fly zones versus the entirety of the of the city. One of the interesting collateral questions that comes up here too, is that if the conclusion is that the city can't uh, create one of these ordinances, and this is germane to Greg's point, the lack of guidance, what then does a police officer on the beat do? Because most state and local police officers have a mandate only to enforce local laws. In fact, some state constitutions don't allow, like Connecticut, don't allow local law enforcement officers to enforce federal law. We saw this in the immigration context. So if you're a police officer walking up on the beat and there's a drone hovering at windshield altitude or something over a roadway or, or at eyeball altitude over a sidewalk, you have to sort of scramble to figure out what's my authority here. Maybe reckless endangerment in a jurisdiction that has reckless endangerment, although only about uh, 14 states have a reckless endangerment statute. Maybe a careless operation of aircraft under a state statute if the officer knows that 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 statute exists or ordinance exists. And so it presents difficulties of the officers. And you'll hear police officers say, what am I supposed to do uh, to act to enforce here? Which also sort of circles back to Matt's point, which is that the law enforcement associations are in these interesting positions where they, when these bills come up, they want special authorities to go after people who are operating drones, while at the same time, they frequently want unlimited authority to operate the drones on their own. Um, we have a question from the audience here, and I, I think I'm going to bring this one to uh, Matthew, which is, uh, which is somewhat related to your points, which is, uh, is there anything to prevent an uninvited drone, perhaps a spy drone, from hovering over my property? What's the penalty if a property owner dispatches, dispatches the uninvited drone? This might be a little related to Brent's uh, work as well. Is there any legislation to cover this situation? Um, and so related to this is further on this question, the facts that this questioner is raising are that they, the client dispatched the drone and, and local prosecutors are now threatening criminal action. And so privacy implications, private actors, and then maybe Tying it to Greg, if, Greg, if I may interject just briefly, if yeah, go ahead, dispatch go ahead. means disabled or destroy, yeah, I'm thinking shooting federal down law. An aircraft, Greg. You've got a federal law; right. uh, it's felony. Right. I I was going to to mention that you know lo local prosecutors might be the least of your worries if you actually shot it. <laughs> yeah. So the question is: Is there anything to prevent an uninvited drone um, to spy on you? Well, federally. Uh, the, there is no warrant requirement for federal use of um, f drones for, for that purpose. Um, as I mentioned before, there are uh, some states that do have warrant requirements um, that may provide um, some protection there. Um, if you're talking about a non-law enforcement, if you just have a nosy neighbor or, or someone else, then uh, I, I think there are um, potential avenues that you can take. Uh, actually, you know, Greg uh, Walden in, in his chapter of the book does discuss that there are um, you know that there are uh, nuisance um, privacy uh, claims that that you can make. Um, as far as legislation, I'm not familiar with any legislation dealing with the actual dispatching of a drone with firearm. But I, I think the federal law on that is pretty clear and um, probably ill advised. But what we're seeing, though, is at least when it comes to state and local, which is of course the the law enforcement agencies um, affecting. Uh, most people is that um, it's going to be up to the states to to figure out if there's going to be a warrant requirement for that kind of behavior or not. Right. Uh, we're nearing the end of the hour. And so this is our last question. Um, and um, it's an interesting one. The question is, is it possible for states to establish drone incubator programs that comply for blanket operational waivers from the FAA 
In this way, states could streamline the waiver process for applicants to their programs instead of the FAA having to specifically review every applicant. And so um, let me expand on the question a little bit. We, we saw in the early days of the legislation, Greg will remember this, that uh, or legislative proposals sort of um, uh, drone test beds. We saw the drone immigration pilot program. Then my uh, former AirMap colleague uh, who now works for an air taxi company has written about the idea of sandboxes, regulatory sandboxes. And then others have written about using, uh, for example, at the Heritage Foundation have written about um, using federalism, uh, you know, permissive approaches to federalism. So rather than having the states regulate drones, have the states be laboratories of democracy, like you see in the autonomous vehicle space. Let the drones go out and operate just like the vehicles operate on the roadway so we can have some learnings about operations at, to accelerate drone adoption. And so is it possible to establish this? And, and I guess I would riff on this. Why hasn't it happened? So Greg Walden, what, is it possible? Why hasn't it happened? Is this federalism approach a good idea or a bad idea? So this would be a innovation oriented federalism approach. What do you think, Greg Walden? Uh, well, I like the idea, um, and we pushed uh, for, for <laughs> the Small EV Coalition pushed for an idea um, in, uh, the, in the 2018 uh, bill on on testing remote ID technologies at and giving blanket waivers at certain places as determined by the FAA in cooperation with state and local governments. Blanket waiver authority for those test beds. So we would support that um, that authority, but I think. There's probably something that needs to be done. Uh, um, I think that legislation probably is sufficient. It was in the context of the UTM. It, to grant actually blanket waiver authority, you might need some more um, more statutory authority. All right, and then uh, Matthew, what about what about this idea? What about blanket operational waivers from the FAA? So let's take drones to uh, Maryland and let them operate autonomously beyond visual line of sight over the city of Baltimore and uh, see what happens. Um, I understand the downside might be there's a privacy implication, but wouldn't the upside be that we would accelerate a series of cases uh, and fact patterns that might prompt legislative responses, right? We would go from the hypothetical dystopian boogeyman to is this real? and maybe prompt a response. So, so isn't possibly accelerating this, even though it might trigger short-term privacy implications, perhaps a good thing because it'll get us to reform more quickly, or is it once we let the no camel's nose under the tent, we've, we've forever enabled the panopticon. I mean, what's your, what's your sense, Matthew? No, I, I certainly, you know, obviously, um, have have concerns about privacy, but I'm I'm inclined towards the former. That um, the the more we can experiment with this new and emerging technology in a variety of jurisdictions, I think the quicker that we'll learn the lessons we need to 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 ensure that we have a a vibrant entrepreneurial uh, space where people feel like they can use drones for commerce and hobbies, while also ensuring that we protect privacy. Uh, I think privacy is a, a difficult question, but it's not um, impossible to to answer. And I think. Uh, seeing um, how many jurisdictions can treat these issues in a variety of ways is one way to do that. Uh, but of course, you know, under the current regulatory regime, I think that's going to be a little difficult. Great. Thanks, Matthew. And then, Brent, what are, you, what are your thoughts on this federalism-based approach? Yeah, in short, I, I think it is possible to establish a drone incubator program or a drone sandbox. You know, the, the FAA, you know, there, there are many within the FAA who want to see this in industry succeed, and, and they're I think if state had a well-crafted plan for this, that, that they would be on board. Um, you know, they have this beyond program working with states and cities uh, and tribal governments. Um, I don't know if that's closed, but frankly, the, the FAA's agreements uh, are pretty ad hoc. I think if there's compelling example, they, they would favor that. And I'll, I'll leave you with one last example uh, that I think is useful. The FAA recently gave BNSF uh, the railroad company, uh, a nat I believe it's a national waiver to have drones below 500 feet using the rail company's property. Uh, they're above their property, uh, including the railways. Um, and so I think if you combine these ideas, this kind of uh, waiver, which can be revoked any time for, for BNSF, they can, they can operate drones below 100 feet above their property and railways uh, nationwide. 
um, with, with this idea of, of states getting involved. I think you, you come close to the approach that I've urged, which is working with state and, and its and its subdivisions and, and allowing these kind of linear operations using a state uh, rights of way and federal rights of way, uh, which is throughout the nation. Great, thanks, Brent. And so, uh, as we begin to bring the program to a close, let me uh, let me do this. Uh, so uh, we've exhausted all of our questions, but if people listening on the podcast would like to get in touch with uh, any of our panelists, let's uh, share our personal or organizational Twitter accounts. And so, if you want to reach out to me or shout at me, you can reach me on Twitter at Gregory McNeil, and then we'll just go in the order in which everyone presented. And so, Greg Walden, what's the best way to reach you or your organization on Twitter? Uh, well, there's there's Twitter addresses, but I just prefer Gregory.Walden at Denson's.com. That's D-E-N-T-O-N-S without apostrophe. And that's Walden uh, with an E-N. Great. Thanks. Gregory.Walden at Denson's.com. Great. And then uh, Brent. Yeah, I'm, I'm Brent Scorup at the Mercatus Center. And you can find me on Twitter uh, at B Scorup, B S K O R U P. Thank you. Wonderful. And then Matthew. I am on Twitter at M underscore Feeney, F double E N E Y. Um, you can visit uh, Cato.org, C A T O.org to read more of my work and pick up a copy of uh, Eyes to the Sky, which is also available on Amazon. Fantastic. So um, as we wrap up here, I want to thank everyone for uh, for turning out for the podcast. And please take a look at the other podcast for the Regulatory Transparency Project and also follow the Regulatory Transparency Project on Twitter. Thanks, everyone, for attending the, the program. And thank you for the questions. Thanks, Thanks Greg. Greg, for moderating. Thanks so much, Greg, and to our panelists. And also thank you to our audience for tuning in. You can check out our website at regproject.org and follow us on all major social media platforms at FedSoc RTP to stay up to date. With that, we are adjourned. On behalf of the Federal Society's Regulatory Transparency Project, thanks for tuning in to the Fourth Branch Podcast. To catch every new episode when it's released, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spreaker. For the latest from RTP, please visit our website at regproject.org. That's R-E-G project.org. This has been a FedSoc audio production. 